Hi everyone. In our final video describing membrane transport, we'll consider vesicular transport. In order to in order to understand it, we want to just sort of consider the idea of a vesicle first of all. So um, when we think of our cell membrane, of course we think of the phospholipid bilayer. I think we're kind of kind of getting used to that by now. Um, but when we think of a vesicle, um, think of uh, almost as if we pinched off a piece of the cell membrane and we created um, sort of a, a, a circle. And of course, we're drawing it in two dimensions because we're drawing everything in two dimensions, but in all fairness, this would really be a three-dimensional structure. So it's essentially a, a, a sphere um, that's sort of like a shell almost, and then on the inside, we can like have some, some, some stuff. Um, so, we, so we still um, see that our, our phospholipid bilayer, the integrity of the phospholipid bilayer is maintained in our vesicle. And then um, we can actually just uh, take a look at some of the, um, so we're not gonna be too specific just yet, but we have um, some, some contents. Most often uh, it's because we're gonna be transporting it somewhere. So there are vesicles that, that um, maybe their function is less to transport and more to do other things like a lysosome um, isn't really transporting, it's just sort of digesting. Um, but in the, in the context of vesicular transport, we really wanna think about that we're bringing these guys somewhere. Um, and so, uh, in order to complete our picture, I just want um, to to uh, draw in um, something called snare proteins. There are a couple of different types of snare proteins, and we're gonna we're gonna show those when we consider um, exocytosis towards the end. So, um, so we definitely want to just this is a, a full picture of, of our vesicle. All right, so there are two types of vesicular transport, like two sort of like headings, and that would be endocytosis and exocytosis. Um, and then there's a couple other sort of things that we can throw in there and mention, but um, for now we'll just kind of start with those. So when we describe endocytosis, let's take a look at the membrane. So naturally when we're going to have um, a part of a cell membrane do endocytosis, there's going to be a like kind of like a pit in the membrane. So to start off with, it's sort of, um, there, it's like almost like a little divot in the membrane that's um, sitting a little bit lower. It's like a little crater, I guess. I'm um, sitting a little bit lower than the rest of the membrane. And um, on, this, on, the, on the cytoplasmic side, so the inside of the cell, we actually have um, these, these, uh, this coating, um, these, these molecules called uh, clathrin. So it's like a, a, a clathrin coating, or we call it clathrin coated pits. Um, and the, those guys are the, on the inside. Um, and they sort of uh, aid in, in helping the vesicle form when it's, when it's time to do that. Um, and so we're just going to sort of draw like a, a little bit of a progression here of what happens. Um, so the vesicle is essentially going to pinch off, and we can see those clathrin um, uh, molecules are still around it. And then um, eventually we'll actually make our vesicle, um, and, uh, and then the vesicle can have a, a couple of different possible fates. Um, and, and the fate, uh, in part or maybe largely, depends on what the specific um, type of endocytosis is that's occurring, um, what the contents are, and, and then what the, you know, what the need is for the cell at that point in time. So the first type of endocytosis we'll consider is penocytosis. Um, and penocytosis is like, the casual way of describing it is like cell drinking. So the cells are just kind of like taking big gulps of water and, um, and some small solutes that are naturally going to be with them. Um, so we can see the water in the small solutes are, you know, originally in the pit. And then um, we can see that as the vesicle pinches off, they're getting kind of trapped in there, and then they're inside the vesicle. Um, and then uh, it's possible that um, this vesicle could travel to another part of the membrane and then perform exocytosis. And we'll actually describe that in a, in a moment. Um, and it's also possible that um, the, the vesicle will fuse with something called an endosome. So an endosome is, a, is another type of vesicle. We really didn't cover this when we talked about the, the um the organelles inside of the uh, inside of the cell, but think of it as sort of like a sorting vesicle. And so, if it fuses with an endosome, um, it, it may um, then allow for the release of contents into the cytoplasm, um, or um, it's possible that we could have a fusion with a lysosome, and, um, and in which case we're going to digest whatever it is that we've taken in. Um, so, in penocytosis, it, it kind of depends. Uh, it depends on what the cell needs at that point in time. Um, all right, so then let's consider phagocytosis next. So phagocytosis um, is really for capturing and, and destroying bacteria and cell debris and other like bad stuff that we really don't want. Um, so the cell um, recognizes the bacteria. It's going to swarm around it as it pinches off to form a vesicle. And then we see the bacteria 
inside of the vesicle just kind of hanging out. Um, so in this particular case, we're very likely going to fuse with an endosome and then fuse with a lysosome and then and actually um, digest or destroy that bacteria because it's something that we don't want in the body anywhere. And then the last type of endocytosis is receptor-mediated endocytosis. And receptor-mediated endocytosis, we notice that there are a, a, an abundance of receptors um, that are present in the, in the pit of the membrane. Um, so uh, these guys are actually looking for specific molecules. So whereas pinocytosis and phagocytosis, it's um, a little bit of a free-for-all. When we talk about receptor-mediated endocytosis, we're talking about looking for specific things that are waiting for those, those molecules. Some examples of things we might take in by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, so we're really talking about like large, um, we call them macromolecules, so like big molecules. Um, something like iron, cholesterol, those are some kind of examples of big molecules that might be coming in this way. Um, maybe even some hormones could come into the cell this way. So uh, a, a variety of things, um, but the receptors have to be specific. Uh, and, and really what we want to think about is, you know, when we consider all the mechanisms for transport, um, since this is the last one, we can kind of think back on the other ones. And, and, you know, some of the things that we need to bring into the cell that are really large, none of the other transport mechanisms have accounted for a large transport. Um, so it is really kind of an important point that the vesicular transport is, is transporting um, those, those macromolecules. Um, so again, we can see that the membrane pinches off and um, the receptors are inside now and they have their contents. And, uh, and depending on what it is, um, you know, this time we may choose to release those contents into the cytoplasm. It's always possible that we're going to uh, use lysosome just the same. Um, so one thing I want to mention, um, just sort of generally speaking, is that if you have endocytosis immediately followed by exocytosis, meaning something is taken in on one side of the membrane and then it's traveled in the vesicle and then it goes to the other side of the membrane and then it's exocytosed, we actually call that transcytosis. Um, so it's also kind of a, you know, it, it doesn't sound like a real thing, but it's a real thing. Um, and so we're just um, transporting across the cell, so transcytosis. Um, and uh, I would say the most common example for this would be penocytosis, but, uh, but it, it kind of depends on, on what it is that we're actually transporting. All right, so now let's consider exocytosis. So exocytosis, um, so we're going to see our, our vesicle, um, and now we're looking at a membrane. So the vesicle is kind of already made, and it, it wants to actually fuse with the membrane and release the contents outside of the cell. Um, so we'll draw our vesicle again, um, and we can see that we have um, uh, our, the membrane that we want to approach, and we have our um, snare proteins. And the, the snare proteins that are associated with the vesicle are actually called V-snare, meaning vesicle snare proteins. Um, and then we also have um, some uh, T snare for T for target, so target snare proteins that are present uh, on the on the cell membrane. Think of this kind of like the vesicle is a little boat. We want to sort of dock the boat, um, so we want to make sure that the boat actually like makes it all the way to the dock, and then it doesn't like accidentally float away. Um, that you know, like if you were thinking of like the contents is like the people inside, the people are actually able to get out safely at the dock. Um, they're not going to fall into the water or anything like that. So, um, so it's kind of the same concept here. So the vesicle, um, the the snare proteins, and there's a, a a couple of other things that have to happen in order for this to occur that we'll consider later on. But for now, we're just gonna just um, get the, the basic understanding. So the snare proteins are like the ropes um, that you throw to sort of um, to, to actually ca like catch the boat and then and then pull the boat into the dock. Um, and so the snare proteins are actually going to associate with each other. And we're just going to draw those separately for a moment. So first they're going to sort of line up um, you know next to each other. And then those those side parts that are sticking out are actually going to twist around each other. So kind of like taking two twist ties and, and twisting them. It's actually called corkscrew. Um, and so then, then they're really, you know, like pretty solidly connected to each other. Um, and then what happens is we'll actually see this opening be created um, on the inside of the, uh, the vesicle. Um, and, and so that the membranes can kind of start to fuse. And so um, we'll just draw sort of like in the transition state here, we'll, we'll, we'll show um, now we have like kind of this vesicle fusion. And, um, and then we can see that the, the, the part of the membrane that was the vesicle is going to become part of the membrane and, and the contents are now um, safely docked. They're able to, they're able to um, be released into the ECF. Um, so we actually see this quite a bit. But when we consider um, exocytosis, 
we're largely talking about release of things like chemical messengers, like neurotransmitters or hormones, release of waste products. Um, so there's lots of things that, that we can kind of keep in mind. Um, so that actually um, that actually concludes our, our description of vesicular transport in terms of um, stuff into and out of the cell. So remember, we're thinking of this in the context of membrane transport. One other thing I want to mention that will come up later is this idea of vesicular trafficking. Um, and so I just, I just want to make this suggestion that something that is um, inside of a vesicle can be transported around inside of the cell. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, moved into the cell or moved out of the cell. Um, it could just be that we're moving it from one area of the cell to another. Um, and, and so we, we're not going to consider that here, like I said, because this is this is really about membrane transport. But I just want to, you know, sort of um, insert that thought because it's something that's kind of important. Um, we're going to see some examples of, of vesicular trafficking. Um, they're going to matter to us, um, especially when we consider um, like how neurons work. Um, so I just want to, you know, kind of let that be a, a, a something to let it settle in as well. So, um, so that actually officially wraps up our explanation of um, vesicular transport as well as all of the concepts in membrane transport. The membrane transport concepts are, are, are super critical um, in terms of some of the leader conceptual concepts in physiology. So my recommendation is watch these videos as many times as needed until you really, really feel comfortable with all the concepts in membrane transport because from now on we just are going to kind of take and apply them and we're going to see them um, in terms of um, how, how cellular functions are performed as well as how we can modify cell functions whether it be something the body's doing or whether it be chemicals or drugs that we're inserting into the body to cause a particular type of change. So um, all those concepts come understood because of a good grasp on, mem uh, on membrane transport. So definitely, definitely take the time to, to make sense of this. So um, that's all for now. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.